apply them to things that we hadn't anticipated at the outset. So we call these novel targets. These are really only novel to us because we hadn't thought about them at the beginning. So we spend a lot of time in this kind of back and forth. And, and uh, we call this approach in our group target-driven methods development, where these complex targets drive the methods forward. And so in some ways, you can draw a very nice connection between complex molecules, methods, developments, and applications of those, of those methods. Um, and sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking it looks just like this. More often than not, it looks more like this, where there are all kinds of convoluted connections between projects that are ongoing in the lab. And the only reason why all of these interconnections can develop is because we take a very broad approach to the science. We're not focused on only one type of chemistry. We're sort of generalists in that sense across a lot of different things. And, and quite often, people have a lot to do with the different kinds of connections that can be developed. And so um, it was a, there was one project in particular I just briefly mentioned uh, where this person who we're here to honor, Harry Wasserman, had an incredible influence. And that was a project that was developed, or devoted toward the synthesis of this complex alkaloid called communism D. It turns out that one of those conversations that I had had with Harry Wasserman sitting in, in his TV room on the couch was about his graduate project. And his project that Woodward had written out for him was to synthesize this molecule 2 keto quinucleidine or quinucleidine. 2 quinucleidine. Um, and in the design of this uh, synthesis, one of the intermediates that we were drawing was a strain lactam. And it turns out that this quinucleidone intermediate that Harry was supposed to generate as a graduate student with Woodward, but never could, it turns out. Um, we were drawing intermediates that were very reminiscent to that. And I remember this, distinctly this conversation that I had with Harry on his sofa, where at the end of this conversation, he's describing his interactions with Woodward and then this, you know, the, the design of the project and how he was unable to synthesize this project, and that they used this non-synthesis as evidence, actually, for a twisted amide and a strained lactam, ultimately for the structure determination and elucidation of penicillins. At the end of that conversation, he says to me, and you know what? No one's ever made that molecule before, even now. And that stuck with me as a second year graduate student, all the way till 2006 when it turns out that I had somebody in the lab as a postdoc and it had been nagging at me for that long. I said, why don't we just try to make this? And we ultimately did. So only because of Harry and those conversations did we make this crazy connection between an alkaloid and this theoretically interesting molecule. Mostly interesting, I think, to people of Harry's generation. It was interesting also. So uh, anyway, many thanks to, to Harry for, for that. So at the end of the day, though, what does our lab hope to accomplish? Well, we hope to develop new strategies and tactics to access complex biologically active substances. We also hope to develop methods that we might use to solve the problems that we're interested in, but more importantly, we're hoping to be able to introduce solutions to potential problems that others might take advantage of. Um, and of course, in an academic setting, we want to try to uncover and exploit really fundamentally new chemistry. So this is what we're aiming to do, and you can make the decision whether we're successful or not. Um, but I'm going to focus on one project today um, that, again, is, is the, the result of this broad approach to synthetic chemistry. So, as an, as an early uh, assistant professor at Caltech, um, four of the first target molecules that we worked on are shown on this slide. These molecules, the zoanthus alkaloids, were one target. This molecule, salad, was another. Garcidel and A, a third, and communist and B, a fourth. Of these structural classes and families and molecules, we've actually only ever made this, and we only made it recently by a formal photosynthesis. So we didn't even actually, I guess, ultimately finish the molecule. We've never made any of these. And I won't disclose today a, a synthesis of any of them, clearly. Um, but what did this teach us, you know, working on these molecules early on in the group? Well, it, it taught my lab that, you know, certainly, um, the students have taught them that complex molecule synthesis is not trivial. That's one lesson it taught them. But it also taught them that there are certain aspects of complex molecule synthesis that we really still are just not very good at. And what was common about these very structurally distinct compounds um, was the, the all carbon quaternary centers that they all uh, bear. So in, in each of these cases, there are multiple, it turns out, all carbon quaternary stereocenters uh, embedded within the framework.
networks, and we just had no real good ways to build these things, just build them synthetically to access compounds that had them present in them. So just making them is hard. And then generating them with stereochemical control is even harder. Uh, Diastereo control is challenging. Uh, and then even generating the very first one in an antioselective fashion was challenging. So we couldn't do any of that in these contexts, and ultimately that's why these syntheses have, have lagged behind the development of the methods that I'll show you. So we became interested in this as a problem, and we started to think there must be ways that we can tackle this problem in a general way. Uh, so uh, what is a, an all-carbon quaternary center? So, um, first off, it's, it's really nothing more than just a quaternary carbon atom. Actually, there are definitions of quaternary carbon atom that say that it's a carbon bound to four other carbon initiated groups. So that means that this is a quaternary center. So there's our carbon in the middle, and there are all of the carbon initiated groups. It also tells us what, the, what then is not a quaternary center. This is not one that's got an oxygen. This is not one that's got amine. And this is not one that's got a halide or some other function. Um, these are not quaternary centers, that is. So why the all carbon? Why do we say all carbon quaternary centers? Well, it's redundant. Um, but we say that because in the literature, it turns out many people call these things quaternary centers. When our lab would call these tetra-substituted tertiary centers. I think that's really the more correct thing. Right? You don't call it quaternary alcohol. <laughs> you call it tertiary alcohol. Right? So the tertiary center, tertiary alkyl haline, um, alpha tertiary amine. So these are not quaternary centers, this one is, and that's really what we're interested in. And so what's the difference and why should we care? Well, it turns out that the stereo-defined synthesis of these is challenging. Um, and we'd like to do that with catalysis, that's the broader problem, we'll get to that in a second. So why are these important? It turns out there are, of course, thousands and thousands of natural products and biologically active molecules that have quaternary centers present in them. Um, lots of them are natural products, some of them are non-natural. Here are some of the examples that we've actually made in the lab. So we are successful from time to time of actually completing a synthesis. And I've shown some of the structures here that we've made. It's not important to really look at them. I realize I can't even see them from here very well. So there's some of them, though. You get the sense some of them are blue. Of course, in our lab, as I mentioned already, there are lots of examples from our own lab that we haven't been able to make. So there are cases there as well, some not prepared uh, in our lab. Um, turns out that actually many compounds are clinically employed that have quaternary centers in them, and, and they're outlined here. Um, actually, in the top 200 uh, pharmaceutical, uh, based on pharmaceutical sales, the top 200 drugs, about 10% of them have quaternary centers. That's kind of a large number. Uh, but the catch is that uh, only an exceedingly small handful of pharmaceutically used uh, agents have man-made or, you know, synthesized quaternary centers within them. Um, almost all of the examples are cases where you buy a compound that has a quaternary center in it and you derivatize elsewhere in the molecule. So think steroids, right? Nobody goes through the trouble of a total synthesis of a steroid in, in order to make a drug molecule. So they purchase the thought centers there. So you know you might ask why? You know, why are there so few that are actually you know synthesized in a laboratory? And, and I would argue it's a lack of general synthetic methods. There really aren't very many methods. There are a few, and of course we, we learned these in Ziegler's class, or maybe many of you learned them in classes with Harry. Uh, it deals all the reaction, plays and rearrangement, cyclopropanations, but not that many more beyond that. We start going down the list and it gets fairly thin in terms of general methods to build, particularly building blocks that you might then use to your advantage to, in, in all kinds of other ways. So you know, let's think about a retrosynthesis of a quaternary center. So here it is in the middle there, and we're going to disconnect, say, this carbon linkage to an R4 group. Um, remember that in a retrosynthesis, you can disconnect these in any way you want. You can heterolyze or homolyze. They're two different heterolytic pathways. So there's three choices for each of these bond constructions. But remember, these are this is what we're talking about, right? These are carbon-carbon linkages at each one of these disconnections, and so. When we do that, of course, every one of these options doesn't look great because now we're trying to bring a, a fairly hindered center close to another carbon atom. We have to make a carbon-carbon bond. There is no other choice. These are all carbon-carbon bonds, and you're going to disconnect it. You have to break a carbon-carbon bond. So sort of any way you choose, they're all bad, um, and they're all challenging. And, and you can understand this in, this in the context, let's say, 
of this system here where you have would have a, a tertiary carbocation and, and an anion. And of course, if any of these substituents might be a proton, you could suffer things like elimination pathways. And so there, there are other lower energy pathways that do chemistry but don't build a quaternary center that interfere with uh, any of these uh, possibilities. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that any of these involve CC bond uh, formation at very hindered positions. That's hard, right? CC bond formation is not trivial. Um, and at our disposal to build these quaternary centers, we, we don't really have kind of the gangbuster CC bond forming reactions that we that we know and, and love. Things like Brignard additions to carbonyls aren't going to do us any good because those will at best make a tertiary alcohol, not a quaternary center. Um, and so as you start to layer in these other aspects of the science that we're interested in, things like catalysis, stereo control, and antioselectivity, that just adds to the, the challenge, I think. Um, and so uh, these are the things that we're interested in. And our approach has been to tackle these types of structures, but really with an eye toward total synthesis application or medicinal chemistry. And so trying to really carve out and build structures uh, that are small, useful building blocks for, for these two endeavors. So we started thinking about what might be the types of reactions we'd be most interested in. And, and it, we were drawn pretty quickly to an enolate alkylation reaction. So we just take a simple cyclic ketone enolate that's functionalized at the alpha position with some alkyl group and alkylate it somehow. Why were we drawn specifically to this kind of target? Well, it came directly out of our efforts in the zoanthus alkyl field. If you think of this mass, aminal as a ketone, alpha to that is an all-carbon quaternary center with two alkyl substituents, and that's as simple as it got. That was the structure we were trying to make. This was our solution to making that, that particular type of motif. So then the next question we had was what kind of R group would we introduce? What, what might we alkylate with and, and still allow ourselves to have some access potentially to stereochemical control and anti control and catalysis? And we were drawn, I think, very quickly to a, a little cation as our reactive alkylating agent because that little cation could very famously be stabilized by transition metals most prevalently by palladium. As soon as one enters into the realm of transition metal catalysis, of course, again, ligands rule. You can start thinking about asymmetric ligands that then control asymmetric catalysis. And so you're thinking along these lines. And as soon as we drew that, of course, you start to think there are thousands of papers in the field of transition metal mediated and catalyzed asymmetric alkylation chemistry. There's chemistry that dates back into the 60s on this in this area by certainly people like Tuji and Trost and many, many others, partly Fowler, lots of Yale connections there. Uh, and we were a young group at this time. This is around 2003 when we were thinking about this, this chemistry, so a long time ago now. Uh, we didn't have time to read thousands of papers in this, in this field. We had to cut to the chase. And the way that we cut to the chase was the molecule. Remember, we were interested in that compound for that synthesis. And so we just looked up that compound in Biocyan at the time, or Reaxis, or SciFinder. And it turns out that compound is known you know, for the better part of a century. Um, it's a kind of compound that you know, Ziegler could teach us in the, in the advanced organic class. You can easily get to this thing. Um, I think Fred would have made it by a glazer variation. Um, so that compound has been known, but it was only known as a racemate. In fact, there was no optical rotation data on this compound in the literature. So that very quickly cut to the chase. It signaled to us that no matter what's in those thousands of papers, this reaction is not there. The one that we want most is not there in an asymmetric context. And so that gave us, I think, freedom to operate and start to try to solve this, solve this problem. Of course, now we know the reasons why it wasn't there and, and what were the limitations of all of these, these papers we've now, I think, read probably most of that literature. Um, and we can get into the details. But to suffice it to say, a non-stabilized enolate undergoing an asymmetric alkylation, and in this case, a prochiral non-stabilized enolate undergoing that kind of reaction with a, a simple allyl electrophile, those are sort of kind of, uh, can, can show you quickly where, where the limits were in terms of the chemistry that was known. So that's the reaction we're interested in. It turns out, though, that there was, a, among the examples of its synthesis uh, in racemic form, uh, there was a, a series of papers by Jiro Tsuji that came out in the early 80s that showed us exactly a blueprint for the chemistry we wanted to do. What Tsuji did was take 
this unusual enolate precursor now. In this case, it's an allylenol carbonate. So the allyl boy at the end of the enolate are embedded in the same structure tied together by this carbonate. Just treating that compound with a very simple palladium zero recipe in THF leads to a decarboxylated alkylation and produces exactly the molecule that we're interested in. So mechanistically, a very simple model you can think of is palladium zero undergoing oxidative addition of the allyl unit, decarboxylation that affords an enolate allyl cation ion pair, if you will. And that this thing, however you might formulate this ion pair, undergoes a regiospecific enolate alkylation to produce the product and, and regenerate palladium zero. Um, the mechanism, I think, is far more complex than this, and, and it immediately must be, when you start just thinking about what is happening here, this is a homogeneous reaction, everything's in solution, the product is building up as the reaction progresses, and it's presenting its acidic protons, right, to presumably this reactive enolate, and yet there's absolutely no cross-reactivity in the system. So if the enolate is ever there, it never runs into this and deprotonates it to lead to alkylation on the wrong side. You just get the product that you that you want. If you start from the tetra substitute enolate, it alkylates there. If you go in with the alternative enolate, it does alkylate on the other side selectively. So it's what you might call a specific, regiospecific reaction in this particular case. Uh, but there was nothing in terms of asymmetric catalysis. And, and you can start to think about it, I guess, in the context of classic uh, palladium high allyl chemistry, if you were to think of that, you might you might start to consider enolate attack on the back side of this high allyl unit. And if that happens, then somehow this ligand framework that's on the back side of the square flame of palladium 2 would have to differentiate the incoming and antiotopic phases as it approaches the allyl unit sort of on the other side of the ligand framework, a long-range communication. And you can imagine that if that is operative, likely you have no enantioselectivity. Um, so with that grim prospect, um, my graduate student at the time, Doug Gehenna, decided just to forge forward. Again, he was desperate. He needed access to this material for his total synthesis efforts. And I'm very glad that he did. He undauntingly went ahead and, and started looking at this uh, and found that, that actually a quite standard ligand um, in the field of a little bit uh, alkylation chemistry, this phosphenoxazole. So there's a phosphine and a heterocycle that binds the palladium and present a chiral environment that using that ligand on palladium actually leads not only to high yields of product, so there's no diminution of yields from the original Suji chemistry, but now with that power ligand in place, we start to see pretty high levels of enantioselectivity across a fairly wide range of substrates. So notice that alka alkyl groups are fine, so moving away from the alpha methyl group to other elongated or bulky or functionalized alkyls are fine. Uh, around the ring, we can use uh, sterically encumbering groups, acid-sensitive groups. Um, in this case, we're using only an enone, uh, and yet there's no cross-reactivity still with that enolate if it's there. There's no Michael addition chemistry. Uh, we can block the other sites of enolization, such as in the tetralone system or this dimethyl, this alpha-alpha uh, trimethylated substrate. Uh, it's no problem. We don't have to, though, and I think that's really the advantage of the method. And then larger and smaller rings also work for this chemistry. But very early on, almost equally interesting to what worked is what didn't work. Um, and here's some examples of what didn't work. So here are cases of um, what you might call low PKA-derived substrate. So as this thing dealylates and decarboxylates, you would generate an enolate that's a relatively stabilized enolate. You could imagine it coming from a relatively low PKA precursor if you were to get there from direct deprotonation. But those ones lead to high yields of products, so the allylic alkylation works fine, but with very low enantioselectivity. So in these cases, whatever is happening here, these are, are proceeding down a pathway that is not uh, enantioselective. And so that to us su suggests that there might be two possible mechanisms uh, going on here, that somehow something leads to a structure you might formulate as either an ion pair or some other formulation, but it Remember, it has to be a neutral formulation because there are no other metal salts in the reaction. You start from a neutral palladium zero and a neutral starting material. And so after decarboxylation, you must have something that's neutral. So at that stage, um, we think that the stabilized enolate, so where this group is not methyl, but something like phenyl or an electron withdrawing group, this likely passes through uh, a CC bond forming step that is that classical mechanism where the enolate would 
attack this from the backside. So the stabilized enolate and the allyl cation can undergo solvent separation. These are likely solvent separated ion pairs, and then that comes back and attacks the allyl unit from the backside. And it does so with poor selectivity because the chiral environment of the ligand is just too far away from the enolate incoming. The substrates that work well are the non-stabilized enolates, the ones like the one I have shown here, this alpha methyl enolate. That thing, we think, doesn't ever solve and separate from its cation. As soon as it's formed, we think this is associated either through an electrostatic type interaction, or perhaps this is just a transition state for ligand substitution at the metal. So if this oxygen attacks palladium, something has to break. One of the bonds has to dissociate. We think the weak link is the link to the allyl that's trans to phosphorus. So as that bond, in essence, dissociates, or that ligand dissociates from the metal, the enolate falls into the square plane. We now have a neutral palladium two square planar complex, and this undergoes reductive elimination and produces the product. We actually think that the reductive elimination, um, we can call this Claisen-inspired, uh, is, is actually a seven-centered pericyclic reductive elimination. Because of the facility with which we form these very hindered centers um, that I've shown, uh, we actually think it's the two pi systems that are overlapping. So the end of the allyl and the end of the enolate that overlap here to form the carbon-carbon bond. And it's an electron reorganization that eventually reduces palladium and liberates the product. So it's very uh, analogous to a Clayson type process from here to here, just with a palladium stuck in the middle. So you, you can think of this as a kind of palladium analog to a divinyl cyclopropane. So that's our working hypothesis, and now for 10 years we've had that as our working hypothesis. We've actually spent at least an entire PhD thesis trying to tear down this mechanism and failing. So it seems like it stood the test of time, and that's our model for how this chemistry works. But this suggests that there are other ways to get into the catalytic cycle that might be easier to, than an enol alloy carbonate. It turns out that synthetically these structures are not trivial to generate. It takes multiple steps to get there, um, and often you have to separate uh, mixtures of olefins at the end. So there must be other ways to enter the cycle. Maybe we can enter directly at, at this point here. Um, and so the easiest way to do that is to, again, turn back the clock to 19th century chemistry um, and take advantage of you know, something I probably learned as a sophomore in Indiana, which was to take a 1,3-dicarbonyl, deprotonate it, and alkylate it. That's how you would do alkylation chemistry in the old days, and then you could, in essence, saponify and decarboxylate. Right? That was sort of pre-LDA alkylation chemistry. Well, here, we take advantage of that selectivity for this alpha position. Right? You never get alkylation anywhere else other than alpha to the, to the stabilized uh, carbonyl. So you take the 1,3-dicarbonyl, deprotonate, and alkylate with whatever you want. You can generate all kinds of substrates this way, conjugate addition, alkylation substrates, benzylation substrates, aldol products, uh, even uh, fluorination you can do with an electrophilic fluoride source. So those are all now our substrates. And so the key to this now is that in the decarboxylated alkylation, we're no longer breaking a carbon-oxygen bond. We're going to break a carbon-carbon bond. So the palladium gets in, dealylates, decarboxylates, breaks the CC bond by fragmentation. That leads to, this, to the tetra-substituted enolate directly, which then undergoes the enolate alkylation. And so you take these racemic mixtures into the chemistry, and 100% of it reacts. There's no kinetic resolution. We just get products out here in uh, pretty good yields and, and quite good enantiosyl selectivities across the board. This allows us to take advantage of, of this generation to access substrates that we just never were able to do using the enol carbonate, the first generation approach. And, and one of those is shown here, the cyclobutanone enolates. So we get into this chemistry by a Wolf rearrangement of these diazodicarbonyls. That undergoes ring contraction to a ketene. We just trap with whatever allylic alcohol we want. That generates the 1,3-dicarbonyl. Uh, here's the deprotonation alkylation chemistry. That works reasonably well, even on the cyclobutanone series. And then we take this, these cyclobutanone beta ketoesters and subject them to our, uh, our conditions. And this undergoes decarboxylated alkylation to produce now a whole range of these alpha-alpha difunctionalized cyclobutanones. These are all compounds that have never been made before. They're new structures. They've certainly never been synthesized through asymmetric alkylation chemistry. Um, and so we think these are interesting for synthesis. We think they might be interesting for uh, drug discovery and other purposes as well. 
So over the years, we've made many of these building blocks and, and lots of different compounds. Um, and uh, we found these actually quite useful for total synthesis. So here are a number of syntheses that actually succeeded. And we finished the molecules. And, and I've shown the ring, in essence, the ring that we started with and the carbons from which the ring came. Uh, and then the quaternary centers that were generated using this technology. You can see quite a range of different types of, of structures that we've been able to access. Uh, not only our lab, though, has been able to use this chemistry, and this has been really gratifying. In the last couple of years, a number of syntheses have been appearing that use our chemistry at early stages, again, to build some building blocks, um, and then elaborate those structures into natural products. And many of those are shown on this slide. And I think, I guess what's most gratifying about this is, is that we find out about these chemistries when they, when they appear in print. Right? So none of these people called us to tell us our chemistry didn't work. Um, and to get clarification on things, they, they apparently had no problem with it, I guess. And it worked out fine and, and worked as advertised. And they were able to use that. And I think that's really uh, terrific. We've been really excited to see that. Um, but all of that chemistry, you know, our development and the development of the chemistry in those other labs and the uses in those other labs and our own lab has centered around ketone enolates um, up to this point, um, as, I, as I've shown. And so a couple of years ago, we started to wonder, what about other types of enolates? We wanted to, to move away from ketone enolates and particularly start thinking about uh, enolates that might have some relevance to alkaloid synthesis or, or perhaps more direct relevance to pharmaceutical chemistry. Um, and so we thought we'd make the, the very conservative shift from ketone to amide uh, enolates. And so we moved from cycloketones to cyclic amides or lactams, uh, shown here. It turns out that, of course, you know, saturated uh, cyclic amines are present in many natural products, and many natural products actually have quaternary centers beta to the nitrogen of that, of that ring. So here's a case where either the five or the six, in both cases, are quaternary centers beta to the nitrogen, um, as they would be in these structures that I've drawn here. Um, it also turns out that, that, of course, saturated amines, cyclic amines, are, are incredibly prevalent in the pharmaceutical industry. There are you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of drug molecules that have these saturated amines in them. But what's amazing is that of all of that, those examples, uh, we've only been able to find three examples where there's a quaternary center that's beta to the amine in that saturated uh, non-aromatic heterocycle. And those three are shown here. Um, two of them are, are uh, well, there's an antigen bolton and, and then an aromatase inhibitor. These compounds are quite old, as is this one. Uh, this one, the quaternary center, isn't the chiral center. It's the one next to it. Uh, these two, there is actually a quaternary center there, but all of them are used or, or, or marketed uh, as racemates. So clearly, again, this points to the lack of general synthetic methods to build these types of structures because the heterocycle itself is incredibly prevalent, and occasionally people use geminal disubstitution to avoid things like metabolism problems, let's say. Uh, but generating structures that have Differential substitution of that beta carbon is just non-existent in the literature. We thought that we could not only tackle our own interests in natural product synthesis in this way, but maybe add something uh, to the sort of lexicon of pharmaceutically interesting building blocks that might be available. So we started thinking about lactam enolates. Um, and we had started this chemistry probably around 2005 um, with just a couple of examples. So we looked at cases in the piperidone series, um, similar to those I just described, so a one through dicarbonyl precursor. And we had put, in one case, a methyl group on the nitrogen here. Uh, and in another case, we put a toggle group. So one that's electron donating and small, and one that's electron withdrawn. Uh, the N-methyl substituent, uh, in essence, shut down reactivity. So that substrate just didn't react under our standard conditions. So we put that aside. The n tosyl substituent had a great effect on the rate. The reaction proceeded incredibly well, very fast, but led to, in essence, racemic product. And so with those results in 2005, we had plenty of other things to do, and we just put it aside for a number of years. Um, but then maybe about two and a half years ago, or three years ago now, um, I had a, a student, a, you know, an exchange student from Japan who came uh, to visit named Taiga Yurino uh, from Kyoto. So Taiga came to the lab and thought, well, let's, let's kind of resurrect this chemistry. He's only here for three months. Let's just you know, give him a project where we might be able to generate some you know, future direction out of those three months. And so 
the idea was that we knew reactivity-wise, electron withdrawing groups on nitrogen was a good thing, and so maybe causal was just you know an outlier. Maybe maybe we could improve on that. So we decided to move from causal to things like you know Bach, CBZ, carbamate type groups, and benzoyl type. So the project for Taiga was to synthesize enough of the precursor where R equals H that he could then introduce a number of different protecting groups on nitrogen and then try out the chemistry. By this time, um, not only was the parent box ligand, this T-butyl box, the one I showed on the first slide, a, a good ligand for the chemistry we had, by this point developed this alternative tristrichloromethylated oxazoline ligand. For certain applications, this turns out to be the better ligand. So we have sort of two ligand frameworks. You'll notice this is just an electronically differentiated box ligand with the same steric as the parent. So the red catalyst and the blue catalyst come out of this. Um, and we also had noted that in certain cases, solvent played a role. Sometimes solvent didn't seem to, to play much of a role at all. But in other substrate classes, in certain cases, THF might be the best solvent. In other cases, a very nonpolar mixture of solvents turns out to be the best. So we didn't know. So this turns out to be kind of a combinatorial exercise, right? So Taiga went into the lab and, and spent about two months building a lot of this material. He then put all of these groups on. And with about 10 days left, you know, he was set to run two by eight by four reactions, plus all the control experiments, and get on the data. Uh, well, you know, lucky for, for Taiga, down the hall from us uh, is this catalysis center where we have a robot. Um, and you know the best part about our catalysis center is not the robot. The best part is the, the director of the catalysis center, Scott Berger. So Scott um, is an, an outstanding synthetic chemist. And Scott went into the lab with Tygen and designed the experiment that needed to be performed. And in essence, we performed all of those individual experiments at the same time uh, in our robot platform. We then uh, did all of the analytics. Um, and on his very last day in the lab, Tyga came to my office with this chart. So on this chart is shown uh, the different group on nitrogen, the different solvents, you know, the red catalyst or the blue catalyst, and the EE goes up this way. So what you'll notice immediately is that Taiga was perfectly able to reproduce the causal result from 2005 down here with the red catalyst at nearly 0% EE. What was astonishing about this, though, is that by the time we moved over to the benzoyl type groups and used the newer blue catalyst, it doesn't even matter which solvent we're in. Uh, these start sort of peaking the top of the chart uh, here. And so I, I always find these charts hard to read. Uh, here are actually the numbers that go along with it. So the yellow box, the blue numbers are the ones with the blue catalyst across the benzoyl series. These are just exceptional EEs that we're observing. Um, and for our lab, I have to specifically say this was really a triumph because for a long time we had results that were, in essence, 90, 91% EE, 88% EE, and we have tried many, many times to increase that EE in the ketone series without being able to. And now all of a sudden in the lactam series, the EEs are just you know, skyrocketing. So Tyga left the next day and was really a hero um, in the group. Uh, we were left to kind of clean up you know, what was next to do. And, and, and so introducing all of those alpha substituent groups that we sort of knew from the ketone series should work. It turns out for the, the benzoyl lactam series, they work exceptionally well. Um, five member rings, seven member rings, and in addition to sixes. Um, but now we can start to mix and match within the systems and start have different, having different kinds of heterocycles. So here's a morpholinone system that works really quite well here. Imids, um, they also work exceptionally well in the series. Um, and it doesn't have to be a benzoyl group. So sort of custom benzoyl-like groups work equally well. Um, but things like CDZ groups and phenyl carbamates you know, work reasonably well. Even an acetyl group looks a little bit like chopped liver at this point, but 88% E, that was pretty good in the key kind of series, and is quite useful, I think, for most of the applications. I think what's interesting about this chemistry is that it immediately became synthetically useful and started intercepting immediately with things that people had done in the past, um, but with limitations. So, for instance, this n benzoyl lactam that comes straight out of our reaction in 99% E intercepts an intermediate that's in a synthesis of this alkaloid fibrachamine that was done a few years ago um, that used chiral auxiliary chemistry to get there. Um, cleavage of the benzoyl group under standard conditions is easy. That works just fine in this parent case. Um, that compound intercepts exactly a structure that was used by Magnus in the synthesis of rosinolam 
the magnitudes the rats would make, presumably because there was no other way to generate this as a single enantiomer without going through a fairly long chiral exuberant process. Uh, and then, uh, just as a proof of principle, just simple reduction of this lactam is like a reduction of any other lactam. Uh, it generates the parent piperidines uh, in this series. And, and this piperidine and all the piperidines that are the result of the structures on the previous slides, as well as all the lactams with this one exception, that's actually the only known compound previous, all of those structures are all new compounds, never been made before. Uh, so not even just as single enantiomers, but even as racemates, they were essentially all new materials. And so I, I'm extremely excited about this chemistry. If you think about this in terms of drug discovery chemistry, again, these heterocycles are all over the place uh, in, in the world of uh, pharmaceuticals. But most of the time, people will build along a kind of linear trajectory. You know, they'll, they'll build out this way. Oftentimes, there's a nitrogen there. They'll build out through the piperazine, build out through there. So they're building along this trajectory because A, you can buy some structures, and B, it avoids chirality. Uh, our case embraces chirality in a kind of right-hand turn that now turns out groups that are in a kind of three-dimensionality. So we think that's going to be really interesting to look at you know, whether we can start to interrogate new binding sites and whether we can start to you know, overcome things like resistance in certain molecules. So we're really quite excited about these as structures for building blocks in, in pharmaceuticals, and that's work that's ongoing uh, currently in the group. So with that, I, I think I'm going to close. I, I hope that um, you've been able to see how in our group, you know, natural products, although I didn't explicitly talk about any natural product synthesis, natural products in our group influence every decision that we make in terms of the types of structures that we target for the methods that we develop in the group. And we hope that these methods then start to move back out into the areas of natural products and influence the ability to make these compounds. Uh, but not only natural products, also uh, other biologically interesting types of small molecules. Uh, so with that, I'll just thank the graduate students and postdocs and who, who uh, performed all the work. This slide is really mostly to, to try to thank um, industry and uh, also the, the national funding agencies for, for their assistance. This is really the slide that's important. It shows you actual faces. Um, I'm incredibly privileged to work with this tremendous group of talented students um, every day uh, and, and go to work every day and work with these people who have tremendous ideas and capabilities that you know, far exceed mine. Uh, and it's tremendous to watch their development through, you know, from start to finish in, in their academic careers. Um, but today, again, is, is really all about uh, this, Harry. Um, and it's really an, an incredible privilege to, to be here. And I, I really look forward to getting to know many of you um, today and tonight uh, as the day progresses. And so thank you for letting me be a part of it.